complementary lines of work that aren't yet complementing each other, but someday maybe will. Uh, yeah, so I'm going to talk today about games. As always with these things, uh, the brunt of the work was done by my PhD student, in this case, uh, James Wright, so a shout out to him. Uh, so let's get started talking about uh, behavioral game theory. So this is uh, an area within experimental economics that uh, many of you probably know has recently been taking off. And it starts from the, for game theorists, really heretical question of asking, do people actually do the things that game theory says that people do? Uh, this is, seems particularly important because many of the recommendations that game theory makes are counterintuitive. They don't seem to, in fact, really uh, conform with our sense of what we ought to do in a strategic situation. And you know, if I had to give a one-word answer to that question, no. Uh, people don't typically do what game theory says that they'll do, or at least they don't reliably do what game theory says they'll do. There are some really beautiful examples of games in which people do precisely what game theory predicts. Uh, a famous example is soccer penalty kicks, or as you, I don't know whether you call it football over here, whatever, whatever it is you call it, penalty kicks in the World Cup uh, are, are pretty well described by uh, uh, equilibrium in a zero-sum game. So there are some examples that are sort of canonical and do a really good job uh, for game theory, but then there are other cases that are just terrible, where game theory predicts one thing and people do another. So, Behavioral game theory, rather than being embarrassed about this phenomenon, tries to take it seriously and say, all right then, can we find a different model which does do a good job of describing what people do? So let me start with a warm-up exercise that will give you something fun to do and uh, allow the, the even later people to straggle it and, and miss the fun exercise. So uh, so this, this game is Traveler's Dilemma. So by show of hands, how many of you have uh, seen this game before? No, good, not very many of you. This is a fun game, so prepare to have, have fun. As, as much fun as you can have in a simultaneous move, perfect information game. <laughs> uh, so so the, the story of the Traveler's Dilemma has this tortured story of two, uh, two people lose identical African masks, which are otherwise unique in the world, and the airline chooses to, to compensate them, but it doesn't know how much compensation to give because the masks are otherwise unique, so it says, of course, instead of just giving you nothing, which is what an airline would really do, we're going to create some crazy game theoretic game for you to elicit what we should pay you. And the way it works is they, they each pick a number uh, purporting to be the value of the mask. And if they say the same number, then we're going to call that their payoff. Uh, because we're going to say they must be telling the truth. They've, they've said the same thing, so we'll pay them whatever it is that they said. Uh, on the other hand, if they pick different numbers, then we'll assume that one of them is lying. And we'll assume that the one who's at the higher number is lying. And so we'll give the player with the lower number what he said, plus a bonus of two for having been an honest sort. And we'll give the guy with the high declaration, again, the low value, because we think that's the truth. And we're going to charge him two for being a deceptive cheat. And so essentially, we're going to pay them both the low number and then transfer two from the, the liar to the, the truth teller. So, so that's the notion of the Traveler's Dilemma. So I want to encourage you to uh, just take like 15, 30 seconds and just play it with uh, a couple of people around you. And it's important that you do this because I want you to think not about solving for some kind of mathematical solution concept, but for actually playing with another person that you can see who you're playing with and thinking about what would get you a good payoff. So. You know, of course, the, the goal in any one of these games is not to be the winner, not to uh, you know, impress your opponent with how clever you are, but rather to get as much utility for yourself as you can. So you know, here we're imagining this is money, and you want to try to just get as much money as you can by playing the game. So I encourage you to do that. So just take, take a moment and do that. How do we do it? Do we just like so say so you might either want to write it down in a slip of paper and simultaneously reveal, or just be honest about what you want to do. But knowing that you would go for 40, I would hurt you for 99. Yeah. <laughs> 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 
Yeah. Yeah. Both of them. Yeah. It's also the way that yeah. I like to play. Yeah. 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 Do you just care about the payoff, not about winning? What's that? You just care about winning. You just care about winning. And both players follow exactly that strategy. And it's not a zero sum game. Yeah, it would be wildly different sums and payoffs. Okay, so let's let's not talk about what we did. So so now I want to assess how you played, which is going to be complicated for me because I have to look at all of you and also three little boxes trying to figure this out. But I want to do this by cumulative distribution by show of hands. <laughs> so the, the way that works is I'm going to call out a number. And if the number that you played in the game is greater than or equal to the number that I said, then you raise your hand. And I'll keep descending. And you can prove a lemma that says if you put your hand up at some point, you should never take it down because it's always going to be greater than or equal to the number I said, although people always take their hands down anyway. <laughs> <laughs> Numbers, Richard? So, so, so let, let, and then we can all, what this will do is we can all look around and see everybody else's hand and get a quick read on the room about how you all play. So, uh, so how many of you played a number greater than or equal to 100? 99. 98. No, he has to double down. <laughs> <laughs> 98. 97. 96. 94. 90. 80. 70. 60. 40. 30. 15. 5. 3. 2. Oh, there was the last one. All right. <laughs> okay. So, what, 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 what can we say about this game? Well, those of you with uh, any experience in game theory and, and kind of 30 seconds to look at the game will quickly notice that this game is, uh, has a unique Nash equilibrium. And what is it? Well, let, let's look at how game theory tells us we're supposed to reason in this game. We're supposed to say, let me consider the action 100, and, and let me note it, and let me compare it to the action 99. And the only difference between these two actions uh, occurs uh, when your opponent plays either 100 or 99. If they play anything less, the same thing happens to you. And if you play 99, uh, and your opponent plays 99, then you're better off playing 99 than 100, because you would get a payoff of 99 rather than a payoff of uh, 97. And if your opponent plays 100 and you play 99, you're again better off, because you'd get a payment of 101 rather than a payment of 100. And so 99 dominates 100. And so the only thing we can say with absolute certainty in this game is you should not play 100, except many of you did. <laughs> um, because you don't need any beliefs about your opponent to see that 100 is just not a good idea. right? 99 is, is just strictly, well, it's weakly better than, than uh, 99 in the sense that there, there's some outcomes where it's strictly better and some outcomes where it's the same. So because you're all economically rational, we can conclude that none of you played 100 except about half of you did. Uh, so that already is a problem if you believe in game theory at all, because you're the kind of people who actually go to a game theory talk at a good university, and still <laughs> half of you are complete fail even domination as, as a strategic objective. So that should really kind of worry us. Um, so, so then what game theory says, which should start to sound implausible at this point, given the other thing I just said, which is that half of you played 100, is that of course you should reason that there is no chance in hell that your opponent would play 100, because that would be irrational. And so you don't want to play 100. You can conclude that your opponent also would never, of course, play 100. And so it's like the game doesn't have 100 in it, because it's such an implausible thing. And so you can throw 100 out of the strategy space for both of you, and now reason about the smaller game that remains. And that's iterated elimination of dominated strategies. Now you look at the strategy 99, and the same argument we made before, um, after this elimination, holds now. And I can now say that 99 uh, dominates, uh, 98 dominates 99, I can throw away 99, and by pushing this all the way down, I end up with a game that has one strategy for both players, which is two, and then the, uh, the unique equilibrium of this one by one game is for both people to play two. And so, so that's the Nash equilibrium, and as far as Nash equilibrium recommendations go, this is a pretty strong one, because it's unique, which Nash equilibria aren't always, it's pure, which Nash equilibria aren't always, which means it's strict, which Nash equilibria aren't always, 
And it's solvable by iterated elimination of dominated strategies, which means you can find it computationally cheaply, which isn't always true for Nash equilibria. So if you're a believer in Nash equilibria, then you, you have to be kind of comforted by a game like this, where, where most of the things that go wrong with Nash equilibria don't go wrong. However, if you want to believe that this describes what people will do, you'll be very dismayed by having seen what everybody did, except for sort of the one stalwart out in Monash or something who actually played too. <laughs> Good for you, brother, you're keeping the flame of game theory alive. <laughs> um, so yeah, for everybody else, what, what can we conclude from this? Well, when I made these slides before having come to see all of you, I wrote on the slide that the vast majority of human players choose between 97 and 100. And that should be interesting because I hadn't met you yet, and yet it was true. And so this goes to show that although people are not well described by Nash equilibrium often, they are pretty predictable. They, they do do kind of similar things from one group of people to the next. And this gives us some hope that it might be possible to actually find a model that predicts what it is that people actually do. Uh, and, and that's kind of going to be what, what we're up to today. Now, let me note that we can make modifications to the game that don't make any difference to the Nash equilibrium predictions that all of a sudden cause people to follow the equilibrium prediction. So uh, in Traveler's Dilemma, if I change the size of this penalty, which was 2, to be something like 50, then all of a sudden everyone will start playing 2. And so that's kind of interesting too. It seems like in equilibrium says that that change shouldn't have mattered at all. All that changes is the number of steps of iterative elimination that it takes to get down to 2-2. Two, two. But for, uh, for reality, that, that does seem to matter. And it seems to tell us that equilibrium is onto something, that, that we can sometimes get into these cases where equilibrium reasoning seems to make a difference. So I, I don't want to say that Nash equilibrium is an utterly ridiculous concept that we should never think about. Uh, I, I think when you're thinking about the repeated play of sophisticated players, uh, you know, market equilibria among you know, large corporations, things like this, uh, equilibrium often is, is quite a sensible thing to reason about, which is why economics has not been utterly foolish for the last 50 years to be thinking, uh, 60 years to be thinking a lot about Nash equilibrium. Uh, but it's not the whole story, particularly when we think about your individual human players like ourselves. So behavioral game theory is basically a name for the enterprise of trying to figure something else out. And that's what I'm going to start by telling you about today. So in this talk, I'm going to survey three different papers that James and I seem to write uh, reliably every two years. So in 2016, I think we'll have another one. Uh, so our first paper, we went to the behavioral game theory literature, just as James was starting with me, and said, let's try to understand the lay of the land. You know, we see there isn't much work in CS on behavioral game theory, and we'd like to start doing something. So, so let's find out what, what is the model that behavioral game theory people like. And let's try to start understanding this model. Maybe we'll do some theory with it. And, and what we discovered to our chagrin was there are many models in the behavioral game theory literature. There are many beautifully conducted studies, which are really painful to conduct, because you have to actually pay people in real money in order to make sure that the payoffs of the game correspond to the payoffs the person actually has. And you have to be careful about the way you set up the experiment so that people don't think they're playing a repeated game when really they're not. So you have to be very careful about information, about communication between the parties. So people do really careful experiments. And so there's lots of great stuff about this literature. What this literature didn't have was a recommendation about which model was actually good. Uh, oddly enough, uh, economists don't really do benchmarks among each other's uh, studies. They, the, the typical kind of economics paper in this area was, uh, here's my model, here are various parameters of my model, here's Nash equilibrium, my model is a whole lot better than Nash equilibrium, and here's how I think you should set the parameters. And then there's just a bunch of different papers like this all proposing different models. Uh, the other thing that it, it turns out uh, about this literature is the economists are not let me say this charitably, because I'm being recorded. Uh, <laughs> the, the, the economists do not seem to be very concerned with uh, predictive behavior. They, they don't seem to be concerned with setting up their models in a way that will generalize well to new data. And, and if you corner them and ask them about this, they, they'll be very straight up about that and say, we're really not concerned about that. We're concerned with describing our data. And so we want to find something that we think reliably describes our data. So in a sense, they want to fit the training data. They don't even really have a concept of test data. And uh, that, as we know in computer science, can be a dangerous place to be. So, so that also kind of muddies the, the water of this literature. So ultimately, James and I found that it was a pretty substantial enterprise to just go through all of the, the data that was already there, all of the models that were already there, and try to figure out what the heck was going on. And 
what we discovered was that something pretty simple and compelling was going on, which is the first thing that I'll tell you. Uh, the second thing I'll tell you is once we figured out what was going on, or at least sort of which models worked and uh, how to make them work, um, we then wanted to look at the parameters of these models, because as you'll discover in a moment, all of these models have free parameters. And we wanted to figure out what, what, the, what values the parameters need to take given the data and what economic conclusions we can draw from this. And this turns out to be kind of tricky for reasons that I'll tell you in a minute. And uh, so, so that actually was, was another pretty major chunk of work, to trying to figure out how to analyze these models and understand what their parameters were telling us. Lastly, um, we then started trying to improve the models. And uh, in particular, uh, last year we proposed a set of richer models of non-strategic behavior, uh, which uh, make a tremendous difference to the accuracy of these models. So that's going to be the uh, outline of our talk. So let me start by telling you about this kind of lay of the land of, of where the economists were circa 2010 when we began. So broadly speaking, there are two big ideas. So even before I say this, let me note what's in the title here. I'm going to constrain myself to simultaneous move games between two players. Um, I, actually, I'm not 100% sure that all of our, I think all of our games are two players. I'm not sure that it matters for this data, uh, for the <coughs> models. I think the models might extend beyond two players, but I think most of the data that's available is two players, and so we just scoped ourselves to two players so we didn't have uh, data that was too sparse. Uh, but it's very important that the models are simultaneous move. There's lots of crazy behavioral phenomena that arise when, when time comes into account. You know, there's anchoring and um, endowment effects and th things like this. So uh, we were able to sidestep all of this by thinking about simultaneous move games or what economists call initial play. Uh, so in that space, there are two kind of key ideas that um, kind of crop up in the, uh, the economic models that people have proposed. Not that they call them quite what we're calling them here. Um, they typically just say, here's my model. But, but here are the kind of the two key things you want to know about. The first is uh, quantal utility maximization instead of utility maximization. So relaxing the idea of best response uh, in a way that I'll tell you in a minute. And the second is iterative reasoning instead of equilibrium reasoning. So let me first of all tell you what I mean by quantal utility maximization. So let's imagine a situation where you have three different uh, uh, outcomes available to you, A, B, and C. Uh, a gives you an expected utility of $4.02 Australian. B gives you $4.01. <laughs> uh, and C gives you $0.25. Cents. So if you're a good game theorist, a von Neumann Morgenstern utility maximizer, you would deterministically choose A because it gives you the highest utility. The idea of quantal utility maximization is to say A and B are pretty much the same. And so they should get played pretty much the same amount. C is pretty terrible compared to A and B, and so it should be played very little, but still not, not zero. So it's essentially a soft max. I, I'm going to take a, a, a kind of a mixture over all of my different options in proportion to uh, something like the log of their utilities. So I'm going to play very little weight on, on things that aren't close to being the max, but things that are pretty close I'm going to spread around. Here's the idea behind iterative reasoning. We have, first of all, non-strategic agents that we're going to call level zero. And what it means to be level zero is that you're somebody who doesn't reason about other players at all. You, you might be playing a strategic game, but you act like you're not. You just look at the game, and you do something non-strategic. And, and, and what almost all of the literature says, and so what we'll say here, is that you just uniformly randomize over all of the, the different actions available to you. Now, this might sound implausible to you, but we don't necessarily have to believe that there's anyone in the world who really is level zero. We just want to have this concept of level zero agents, which is going to turn out that other agents reason about. So, so let's imagine that we have these fictitious level zero people who uniformly randomize over their options. Um, so they, they don't know what's going to happen, so they just put some, some distribution down. Now we have level one people. And level one people are people who think about level zero people. And so they're going to respond in some kind of sensible way to the beliefs that everyone else is a level zero person. And so uh, here, for example, they, they might, by taking into account this distribution over level zero people, they're able to actually attribute expected utilities to their different choices, and then they're able to respond. And they could respond by best response, or as I've drawn here, they could respond by quantal response. 
Then we have level two people, and level two people are people who are aware of the, the levels below them. So, so depending on the particular model, they might be only aware of level one people, or they might be aware of both level one and level zero people, and so then they do something more sophisticated, taking into account, um, again, these beliefs of the levels below them. And so we can just have these hierarchies of levels going as high up as we want, which basically allows us to think about iterative best response. So we can do some finite number of steps of iterative best response when we have some finite number of levels. So uh, using these two ideas, I can now describe to you uh, four models that are kind of the, the, the four general models that I'm able to find in the literature in economics. And I should say, what do I mean by a general model? To be interesting to me, a behavioral game theory model has to have the following form. You have to be able to give it an arbitrary game and get back a prediction. So there's lots of work that says, hey, in Traveler's Dilemma, people seem to do this kind of thing. That's not useful to me if I get given an arbitrary matrix game. So what I really want is some way of evaluating a completely novel game and making a prediction that I can then test. Uh, as far as I know, these are the four models that uh, have been proposed that are able to do that. Um, there, we could argue about a couple of other things on the edges that, that are, are sort of able to make predictions. But anyway, I'll, I'll tell you about these four. Uh, so the first is quantal response equilibrium. This basically takes the idea of Nash equilibrium and generalizes it to quantal response. So if you take out um, best response and you replace the best response sub subroutine with quantal response, then you get quantal response equilibrium. Now, it, may, it might not be obvious to you that there would be a fixed point in the quantal uh, response uh, dynamic. Uh, it turns out that there is. Uh, this was proven, I, I think, also by Michelby and Paul Free, who also gave a computational procedure for finding um, such a, an equilibrium. So, so, so and their, their point was that people don't care about small utility differences, and so this best response is too harsh, and so we should care about quantum response. Level K is uh, an iterative reasoning model that says level M agents uh, perfectly best respond to level M minus 1 agents. And then we add in some random noise. So with some small probability, they do kind of whatever. And with the rest of the probability, they perfectly best respond to the agents one level below them. Uh, cognitive hierarchy is a different iterative response model that says level M agents best respond to the true distribution of agents at all the levels below them. So there's, there's going to end up being some distribution in the population across what level people are. And if you're a level M agent, then you know the true, you act as though you know the true distribution below you. You obviously don't think anybody is at the same level or above. If you thought that, you ought to be a higher level yourself to get the jump on them. So, so being a level M agent means you think you're kind of outsmarting everybody else. So you think the mass is below you. And in, in the level K model, we say you think all the mass is one step below you. Here we say you, you think the mass is distributed as it really is below you, but renormalized. Uh, and then the quantal level K model, that I'll call it QLK, um, is like uh, level K, and co um, but, but with quantal best response. Um, it's not actually in the literature, but uh, quantal cognitive hierarchy, similarly, we could take the cognitive hierarchy model and, and replace best response with uh, quantal best response. Turns out that the, the authors of cognitive hierarchy were kind of aware of this idea, but didn't publish it. So, so these are the models that I, I want to talk about today. So. Uh, let me say, incidentally, I'm talking about work from economics, which means you should all act like economists and just violently interrupt me at any time that you <laughs> have anything you want to say. Um, this is maybe a good opportunity to stop and see if you have any pent-up energy you want to vent. You all happy? Somebody has to go first. So is there some link to the Monte Carlo, nested Monte Carlo, with the, with the levels and nested Monte Carlo? I'm not sure what this would have to do with Monte Carlo. Maybe this is a maybe this is a model I just don't know about. But but so far, Monte Carlo strikes me as a computational technique for estimating something about a distribution. And here, I'm, I'm just defining these things as though computation was not a problem. Okay. Yeah. Non-behavior question: uh, What's the complexity of uh, finding equilibrium under these models? Um, most of them are going to be very easy. Um, Even QRE. What's that? Even QRE. No, I was going to say QRE is the hard one. So uh, QRE, the algorithm we have is a homotopy algorithm. It's basically an adaptation of the same homotopy algorithms we use to compute Nash equilibrium. So I don't know that anyone has proven this, but I, I think it's very likely to be PPAD complete. Um, I, I think actually in the limit, uh, so I haven't 
yet spoken about this. I think it's probably my next slide, but all of these models have parameters. So the, the QRE has a parameter which, as it goes to infinity, it becomes Nash. So uh, I think in that way, we could probably argue that, that it's PBAB complete. Uh, the, the others, uh, given settings of their parameters, uh, are all really very straightforward polynomial, lower polynomial to estimate. Uh, the, the hard part is figuring out what values their parameters need to take. And that's, that's what I'll spend more time talking about. But, but when you actually get a fully instantiated model that includes the parameters, the other ones are all very straightforward. Um, little k, you have a reference from 2001, and yeah. quintal k from 19... Yeah, it's funny, isn't it? Yeah, yeah it's true. <laughs> 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 um, I, I guess all I can say is, these guys didn't actually call it quantum level k, they didn't even give it a name, actually. Uh, but you're right, um, you might notice that this model appears to be a more general version of this model, which came later. And, yeah, it is. <laughs> I can't explain it either, it's different people. Um, so... Yeah, one of the most general models actually came latest, except that they have, um, the, the, these guys at the bottom did some really weird things, too. So they're, the, the, the sort of conceptually the model is general, but then it has some funny choices in it about how certain things work. But, but yeah, broadly speaking, it, it, uh, and I, I can tell you technically what that is later, but, but yeah, broadly speaking, good on. Yeah. Um, but then we'll take a merge to something that's like, kind of, well, there's not even really a notion of converging, right? So um, uh, maybe it's not clear from the way that I've said this here, but, but this isn't like an infinite series. You, you set up the model with some, typically some finite number of levels. And then you're just happy with So either some finite no number of levels, which is typically what the level K guys do, or um, a parametric distribution that goes to infinity but has a small number of parameters, which is what the cognitive hierarchy guys tend to do. Uh, in, in either of those cases, you just have some finite set of parameters to estimate from data, so there's really no... But there's no common... Like, if the k, if at each level it can be completely different, and you're just choosing an arbitrary number, then... Uh, so, a, a nice property that Nash equilibrium has is that nobody is doing something wrong with respect... To, everyone has true beliefs, and everyone's responding correctly to those beliefs. Anything other than Nash is not going to have that property. Right? So these other models are going to just have people doing things that don't make sense. Or, or maybe a better way of saying it is, People are going to have beliefs, all of which can't be true at the same time. And they're going to be doing things that make sense given those beliefs, but these beliefs are just going to be wrong. So, so it sounds like your, your question is sort of voicing discomfort with the idea that people can have wildly inconsistent beliefs, which if you're a game theorist, it, that it's, it's good game theory practice to be uncomfortable about that. But, but so it is with behavioral models. Yeah. Which of these is actually good at predicting human behavior? You'll find it in a slide or two. It's <laughs> best to build just a little bit longer. Uh, but, but actually, all of them are important to our story. So I, I've stripped away the details that I think are, are not interesting. But, but let's get to it then. So, um, so, so before I answer that, we have to even think about what it means to ask that question. Because it's a little hard to unpack um, even how you would answer it. So, so how do we do this? Well, typically, we get a bunch of people and they're in a room, typically psychology undergraduates, because they're gluttons for this sort of thing. And we pay them money to play games with each other, and we record what happened. And we end up with a bunch of observations of games and things people did in those games. And we now want to take that as a data set and try to figure out something about which model is better than which other model. And so let's imagine QRE, for example, is the model we're thinking about. And we want to know how well did it do. So how do we do that? Um, First of all, we have a parameter in the model, which is maybe not entirely obvious to you because I haven't shown you the equations because they take up one slide for a model and it's a lot of math to look at, but uh, QRE, remember I said small utility differences don't really matter to people, but big utility differences do. To, to put kind of meat on that bone, I've got to tell you what small and big mean, right? So there's a parameter that essentially says what kind of utility difference is small. Um, and, and that parameter in QRE is called lambda. And so as lambda goes to infinity, that means even the smallest of small utility differences are important to me, and that's where we recover Nash. Uh, when lambda is zero, that says every utility difference is completely irrelevant to me, and I'm always going to best respond uniformly. And uh, in between, you get uh, more interesting stuff. So in order to decide whether my model does well on a given data set, I need to know, well, which model do you really mean? Which value of lambda are we even talking about here? So you need to somehow suck the lambda, and then you need to evaluate the model given that lambda uh, and ensure that, that you've done that in a way that generalizes to uh, new play by the same sort of people. So, 
So this is a kind of machine learning problem. So here's what we uh, propose to do. It's a very standard thing for computer scientists and uh, somewhat less standard thing, which is just a completely surprising thing for economists. Uh, so we take our data and we randomly partition it into a training set and a test set. We choose parameter values to maximize the likelihood of the training data. So we say, um, let me find some parameter values, in this case a lambda, which will apply to the model. And if we want to reduce variance, we can do this multiple times with different partitions between training and test and average the results, and that'll give us a, a more robust estimate of the likelihood of our test data under this procedure. Now, th this might be making you uncomfortable because you, you might wish that I could say something like you know, accuracy fraction or something rather than likelihood of test data, which seems really hard to think about. But notice that I can't because these models are, are saying that people make probabilistic play, right? All of these models say, here's the distribution that your action is going to be drawn from. But what I actually observe is not probability distributions. What I observe is samples from those distributions. So I need a way of saying, uh, do these samples look like they came more from this distribution than from that distribution? Right? Notice that if I proposed, what people did was they played the uniform distribution over everything. I, I would never see anything that would allow me to rule out that hypothesis. Right? Any play at all would be consistent with that hypothesis. Right? If somebody went heads, 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 I would say, perfect. You know, that was a fair coin and a really unlikely event. And, and you couldn't tell me that that was wrong. You could just tell me that was pretty unlikely. And, and so the way of arguing against that model is to say the likelihood of the data that you got is pretty low if your model is that that was a fair coin. And the model that that's a biased coin makes that data look a lot more likely. And so that's why I'm using likelihood here to argue, um, to argue that one model makes more sense than another. Um, so any questions about how we're going to evaluate these things? Because this is what I'm going to do from here on in. One yeah. thing I find really weird is you get to choose a different lambda for each training and test set cut. So, has anyone tried to say, well, we have to choose one lambda? For that, that, that's a good point. So um, the, the way I've written it here without the last bullet, we would just be choosing one lambda, and, and that's fine. And right. when we do it with multiple lambdas, what we're really evaluating is the quality of the procedure. Mm -hmm. um, but we, we might worry that it matters that we're getting different lambdas. Actually, the second topic I'm going to talk about with parameter importance mm -hmm. exactly tries to get at that kind of issue and say, you know, what lambda values make this work? You know, how much mm -hmm. variance am I going to get in lambda? Mm -hmm. So. If you're an economist and you actually care about what these parameters mean, that could be pretty important to you. So, so let's defer that until part two, which is coming up pretty soon, but, but good thing to be thinking about, absolutely. Uh, but otherwise, notice that we're still able to sort of robustly estimate, you know, given a sample from this distribution, how well does the best model in this family do in terms of generalizing to new data? Right? Statistically, it makes sense. We just have to be comfortable with the fact that we haven't really identified a lambda. Mm -hmm. Anybody else? Anybody remote who has something to, to ask? You guys are allowed to ask things too. <laughs> you can hold up science with your question. No? No good? Okay, well feel free to jump in. Okay, so, so then we wanted, we of course need some data to work with. And being computer scientists, the last thing we wanted was to pay a bunch of psychology undergraduates to play games with each other. I don't even know how you get a grant that lets you do that. Uh, but luckily there is tons of good data out there that has been gathered by others. So what we did was we just took absolutely everything that we could find. And uh, I'm not going to tell you the nuts and bolts of what all these things are, but here are nine different distributions that uh, basically everything we could find in the econ literature that has been gathered with real people. Uh, I just want you to notice that all of them involve many different games. So the smallest of these has eight different games in it, and the biggest has 20. So they all have people playing not just the same game over and over again, but very different games. Uh, and they have many, many samples. So the smallest one has 500 samples, and the biggest one has uh, 15,000. So we observe many different uh, examples of play. And then we, uh, we took all of these data sets. We, we looked at them individually, but it's a lot to look at. So we also uh, made two different combined data sets. Uh, one that I'll call all six, which is 400 samples from the first six, um, because when we started doing this work, we only knew about the first six data sets. And combo eight is what I'll mostly talk about. And that's um, everything except uh, HPC09, which we held out as a validation set to make sure that, the, so that we can talk about generalization to a completely different set. So, so basically, with, uh, what I'm doing in these cases, I, I'm really taking all of this different data, and I'm just sort of throwing it all together, undifferentiated, into a big bin. 
and making this crazy meta data set that involves different kinds of people from different places playing different games. And that's what I'm going to hope that I can actually make some sense of. And because I'm going to be splitting training and test data, if I'm able to generalize, I really am making some kind of sense on, on this crazy data. Uh, is it yeah. still all psychology students that were in an artificial environment playing these artificial games? Uh, it's definitely all people in artificial environments. I'm not sure they're all psychology students, but it's mm -hmm. all people in kind of laboratory conditions, carefully controlled, playing okay, matrix so games and being paid. There's no way of getting real data from real games in any form? It's Whatever very that hard to know what people's utility functions are in real games. Mm -hmm. right? You can tell people, here's a game, but maybe they really care about winning. You know, maybe they care about impressing their girlfriend. Maybe they care about you know not taking too long. So having all of these factors, you know, and then that would mean that effectively they were playing a different game than you thought they were. And when you think you've explained something about the first game, you know, it's getting muddied by the changing utility function. So typically, this is why these controlled situations are pretty important because otherwise it's very hard to know what you're measuring. I understand that, but I also understand that they have been criticized for precisely that that they are control studies in an artificial environment. I think that's fair enough. I, I think uh, you know, what I would say is that in these controlled games and artificial environments, people's play is pretty regular. It's not just crazy randomness. And nevertheless, there have, people have not been that great at predicting it. Mm -hmm. So you might say it's not the be-all and end-all. Even if we could nail this, that doesn't solve the game theoretic problems of the world. I would tend to agree with that. But, but it seems like a pretty good place to start, and I think a problem that hasn't yet really been being killed. So I think it's it's good at least to understand how we would do that. Yeah, no, I fully agree with that. I just wonder how one could possibly get data from real <laughs> Well, so we're, we're, for example, starting to talk to Google, and it's beyond the scope of this talk, about um, using these ideas to think about how people bid in ad auctions, how sort of small bidders bid in ad auctions. Mm -hmm. So that's a place where you, know, you might think that because there's a strong economic motivation, much of, the, uh, much of these kinds of concerns about what the utility function really is could go away. So I think the way you would go further is you'd go deep into one application domain and understand it very well. Mm -hmm. but, uh, but that's not what I'm going to tell you right now. Uh, so here in one slide is the answer to the question, what happened? Uh, so this is what happened. Uh, as you can see, it's very colorful. Um, so, so let me walk you through. Um, so on the left here, I have all six. Um, on the x-axis, I have different data sets. So the one that I think is most interesting is the first one, because this is the one that combines uh, observations across many data sets. Um, and then the other ones are, uh, are individual data sets that, that make up all six. Um, on the y-axis, I'm showing you the likelihood improvement over uh, making a uniform prediction. So uh, specifically what we did, so everything has very low likelihood, right? Any given sample has very low likelihood. So one way we can make these numbers make more sense is we can look at the, li the likelihood as predicted by how, how likely our model makes the test data. And then we can say how likely does saying that everyone uniformly randomized over all the actions make the test data. And then we can take the first number and divide it by the second number. And that gives us a kind of normalized likelihood. It gives us a likelihood ratio that says, how much more likely is the prediction of the model than the uniform prediction? And basically, if the answer is one, you know, they're equally likely, then you have a really terrible model. Your model is no better than just claiming that everybody uniformly randomizes over everything. So you'd like to see that it's, it's better than that, and you'd like to see that it's a lot better than that. Uh, but that, that's uh, a kind of a safe normalization. Now, something you might notice is that all of these numbers are much bigger than all of these numbers. That doesn't mean anything. Uh, uh, an unfortunate property of likelihood ratios is that they're skewed by uh, the number of uh, observations in the data set. Right? The more observations you have, the less likely everything gets. Uh, and also, they're skewed in a more complex way. If that was all it is. We can actually roll, uh, undo that. But it's conflated with the number of actions people have. The more actions people have, also, the less likely things get. Uh, and so. Uh, it's kind of a mess, and so uh, as tempting as it is, I want to just encourage you not to compare the heights of one data set to another. It really means nothing. But what does mean something is the relative heights within a data set. So what I can say here is this guy is um, 10 to the 10 times less likely than this guy, a and that's true. So the relative likelihoods within a data set are what I want to look at here. And so what can I see? Well, first of all, the red um, bars here talk about Nash equilibrium. And I haven't exactly told you how I do this. It turns out finding a likelihood prediction out of Nash equilibrium is pretty hard to do because Nash equilibrium very often says that things are impossible. And then those things happen. And then that gives you 
uh, you know, your, your, your Bayesian brain blows up because a probability of zero event just happened, and so maybe you have like negative infinity likelihood. So to keep that from happening, we actually have to create parameters for Nash equilibrium two that say there's some amount of random noise happening, and the rest of everything is Nash equilibrium. Uh, so we still have parameters that we fit from data here, because of course, how much noise should you have? Yeah. So how do you cater for multiple Nash equilibria? That's the second thing I was just about to say. You also have the problem of multiple Nash equilibria. And so uh, what do you do there? Um, the, that's why I have two bars for Nash equilibrium. So uh, this uh, lighter bar says, I'm just going to uniformly randomize over all Nash equilibria and imagine that people perfectly coordinate to that equilibrium. Why am I going to do that? I don't know. That's something I can do with Nash equilibrium that, that makes some kind of sense. Um, well, actually, coordination doesn't really matter. I, I'm, I'm going to, really, it's a question about what is an individual person going to play. So I say the person is going to find their Nash equilibrium strategies and uniformly randomize overall of them in proportion to how many different Nash equilibria they occur within. But yeah. How do you cater for that computationally if there are infinite number of, uh, it's easy? Um, it's a good question. And I think our games don't have any infinite numbers of Nash equilibrium, but that's a good question. We'd have to define what happens there. Um, um, but uh, you might, you, there are lots of ways of objecting to that particular Nash equilibrium characterization. So uh, the red one says, I'm going to give Nash equilibrium an unfair advantage. I'm going to peek at the test set, which ordinarily you shouldn't do because that doesn't generalize. And I'm going to pick the unique Nash equilibrium that does the best among all of the Nash equilibria on the test set. I'm going to have uh, a parameter for, re for noise again, and I'm going to set that in whatever way it works as well as possible. So the, basically this shape, this light red line, is the best we actually know how to do in terms of Nash equilibrium that can be run on a game I've never seen before. The, the dark red one cheats by peeking at the test set and picking the equilibrium that works the best. And you can sort of think of that as a kind of upper bound on how much explanatory power you can find in Nash equilibrium. Because even by cheating, this is how well Nash equilibrium can do. Um, and of course, you know, higher is better. So the first thing you should see here is that by and large, except for this data set here, I guess also this one, which is kind of a funny one, um, Nash equilibrium does pretty poorly, um, even when it's cheating. Uh, this is not a big surprise. This is the thing that the economics literature has most decisively shown already. So this is kind of kicking a dead horse, but for kind of completeness, we wanted to look at this too. I should mention this particular data set was explicitly constructed to have 50% games where Nash equilibrium works really well <coughs> and 50% games where Nash equilibrium works badly. That's just what they were trying to show in that paper. So the fact that Nash equilibrium does pretty well when we let it cheat is not surprising in that data set. Um, anyway, enough about Nash equilibrium. This next block of three green models are level K, Poisson cognitive hierarchy, and QRE. So these are all of the models that use one of those two ideas that I showed you. And interestingly, you can see they're pretty similar to each other. There are some games where, uh, sorry, some distributions where the QRE ideas seem to work better than the iterative reasoning ideas. There are other ones where the iterative reasoning ideas seem to work better than QRE. And notice this is a log scale, so those differences can still kind of matter. But by and large, they're, they're relatively closely tied. And the punchline is that these models that combine both uh, are really just reliably the best models across all of these data sets. And we were pretty surprised to find this. We, we really expected to end up with a story that said, you know, well, it's complicated when you look at a lot of games, sometimes one thing and sometimes another thing. And it's pretty unusual in this kind of empirical work to get something this crisp that pops out. And I think, you know, at the end, it really looks like QLK or QCH are, are just better. Uh, at the time when we, uh, when we started with this, uh, we didn't even have QCH because it's never actually been proposed in the literature. Um, we thought we invented it later and then the authors of CH told us, no, no, really, we always knew about it. Um, but you know, among the ones that have ever been proposed, QLK just is overwhelmingly the better. And isn't it weird that that's the first one to have been proposed? That, that basically the subsequent decade of work in experimental economics resulted in models that performed less well. Uh, I'll notice that nobody else in the economics literature has done as thorough a computational job of optimizing the parameters of these things, nor of thinking about generalization to test sets. Uh, it's actually computationally pretty tricky to do these uh, non-convex optimizations, particularly for QLK, which has uh, five very badly behaved parameters that uh, really you have to work pretty hard to optimize them. We had to use a big computer cluster, which I imagine in 94, Stalin Wilson didn't have. So that, that might partly explain this. But, uh, but on the whole, it's a little bit mysterious. So the, the punchline is 
You know, here are these two ideas, iterative reasoning and quantal best response, and you should use them both. They, they really both seem to complement each other. Um, so uh, here is the, uh, the quantal cognitive hierarchy model. Now, now that I've told you, you really kind of want one thing, it's the, the dark blue line here, the quantal cognitive hierarchy is probably our favorite. So, so let me tell you a little bit more uh, mathematically how this model works. So what we're going to say is that agent levels are drawn from some distribution G, and agent at level M uh, responds to the truncated true distribution of, uh, below his own level, so between levels uh, 0 and M minus 1, and they quantally respond to their beliefs. So uh, the probability distribution for agents of level 0 for playing a given action is just uniform across all the actions, and then uh, for everybody else, it's a quantal best response to the truncated levels below them. And then, uh, so that, that's how we evaluate it for a given action, and then we just normalize these quantal best response to get, it, to get a, a probability distribution. So, uh, obviously I'm using a bunch of notation that I haven't defined here, but hopefully that, that gives you enough to sort of schematically see how this would work. So, given the, the distributions, uh, this is all pretty straightforward to evaluate. And the quantal best response function is just a logit. Okay, so here's something that you might be worrying about. At, at this point, I've told you that when I find this maximum likelihood model, this uh, QCH or QLK model do really well, but they don't really tell us much about the parameters, right? If I know that some value of, of lambda gave me uh, good predictions, I don't know that some very different value of lambda might not also have given me very good predictions, right? It, uh, it might be that lambda hardly matters at all and that almost any value of lambda is just great. Or it might be that lambda is really correlated with something else, and if I set lambda in one way, then that sort of forces the value I set for something else, but then I'll get a good prediction. So it would be dangerous to just look at a maximum likelihood fit, look at what uh, lambda came out, and just conclude something about people's behavior from that. Because I don't really know counterfactually how good all these other models would have been. Um, so, so what's the right way of trying to answer that question? Of what, what do the models tell me about uh, what, what values the parameters should take? Uh, really the right thing to do, the Bayesian thing to do, is, because of course the Bayesian thing is the right thing, as you all know, um, is to take the, uh, the probability distribution over the parameters given the data, and try to look at this posterior. So basically the, data, the, the maximum likelihood thing says, you know, which parameters uh, does the data argue for the most? What's the kind of peak? of this posterior distribution. But if I want to think about how important the parameters are, I really want to think not just about the maximum point in this distribution, but rather everything in the distribution. I want to think about the whole distribution. So how do I come up with the whole distribution of the likelihood that I would get for every parameter setting in the world? Uh, this is uh, a pretty involved statistical estimation problem. We used a sequential Monte Carlo techniques uh, to try to sample from the posterior and end up getting a sample estimate of the posterior. Um, th this, if, this took James about eight months of work in statistics and then kind of computational implementation to make this thing work. There's a lot of black magic voodoo in uh, high dimensional statistical uh, sampling um, work. So I, I'm not going to tell you really what he did, um, but uh, I'm happy to talk about that offline. But let's just believe that after eight months that worked. There are ways of validating that it works. and. and uh, essentially, it, it seems to work. So let me instead tell you more kind of what I can, can conclude economically about this. So here is the posterior distribution over levels that I get out of the QCH model when I do this kind of analysis. So the analysis takes a month in our cluster. We end up with this um, cumulative density function. So what is this telling me? Uh, this says, what is the uh, frequency with which I observe a given probability over the number of people of each level. And this is when I was doing QCH with a parametric model over level. So I, I think I, in this case, allowed levels 0, 1, 2, and 3, and I just fit a, a number of people for every level, and I just had to sum to 1. So uh, here's how many level 0 people I observe. I observe that there are bet somewhere between about 30% and 34% or something of people are level zero. So that's a pretty tight prediction. So the model is pretty sure that there are around about 30% of the population who are level zero. And that should be surprising to us because remember I told you level zero was supposed to be a fictitious construct that just doesn't even exist. When I've shown this result to economists, they get very upset and they say level, people aren't, level zero people aren't supposed to exist. And I say, well, yes, but look at this. Uh, the, the data really strongly argues for the existence of level zero people. 
right? The, the data says that the probability that there are no level zero people is just pretty darn close to zero. So that's uh, quite surprising. Can I ask if they're, if, are they really seriously playing the game or the payoffs are such that they, well, well, so it it, it's important to notice, I'm not identifying individual people and saying, you, sir, are a level zero person. <laughs> what, what I'm saying is the model in which this many level zero people are there does a way better job of predicting what happened than the model that, that doesn't think anybody was level zero. Mm -hmm. right, so we're speaking at a more kind of abstracted mm -hmm. level. So it's a little bit harder to, to reason that way. But you know, if I don't think that a bunch of people are level zero and I nevertheless committed to this model, I do vastly worse. That's really what this means. Um, so here's how many level one people the model thinks there are. Uh, again, it's very, uh, really concentrated in distribution, so it strongly identifies the number, but it thinks it's a lot smaller. And you can see we have overwhelming statistical significance in our claim that there are fewer level one people than level zero people. Here's how many level two people the model thinks there are, and here's how many level three. Now, that's pretty weird because the model thinks that there are a lot of level zero people, not very many level, level one people, and then a lot of level two people again. Um, th this really goes against the economic orthodoxy of behavioral game theory, but again, it's very strongly argued for in the data. And if you think about it, I think on reflection it makes a kind of sense. That I think what this says is there are some people who don't really think strategically about the game at all. They just do something. And then there are people who do strategically reason, but if you're going to bother to strategically reason, thinking two steps ahead is a pretty comfortable number of steps. There aren't that many people who are just going to think one step ahead. And, uh, and then it kind of falls off. There, there are also kind of fewer people who are going to think as much as three steps ahead. So uh, whether you believe that or not, I'm showing you this on one particular data set, but this pattern has been remarkably consistent. That, um, between, whether we're looking at level K or uh, cognitive hierarchy, and regardless of which data set we're looking at, we very robustly see a lot of zero, not very much one, a lot of two, and then it falls off in there. Yeah. If you're allowing four level four agents, would the distribution... We, we've the done this going up four, one. five, six, seven. And we we nevertheless see this pattern where, it, where there's a spike at zero and a two, and then it falls off. Uh, and in fact, yeah, we really robustly see that. So, so that led us to propose a new model, which we call spike poisson. Uh, so the, the standard uh, cognitive hierarchy model that people use has a Poisson distribution over the number of levels, which is nice because it lets you fit this level distribution without having a maximum level uh, with only one parameter. The problem with that is the Poisson distributions are unimodal. So they're, they're not capable of fitting a distribution that spikes at zero and then spikes again at two. And if that's what we believe is in the data, we're going to have trouble. And indeed, the cognitive hierarchy models that we fit using Poissons tend to have pretty lousy performance. I'm not showing that to you here. So we said, what if we add a parameter which says how much mass there is at zero, and then otherwise fit a Poisson? It can put its mode wherever it wants, but that will give us the ability to fit a bimodal distribution with a spike at zero and another spike somewhere else. So that's what we call spike Poisson, and uh, basically it does really well. So uh, we think that this is uh, the best thing that you can do. Uh, it, well, basically, we think it's the best thing you can do if you want to minimize the number of parameters. And these models where you actually just fit a histogram at every level obviously do well too when you have enough data, <laughs> but it would be nice to have something with fewer parameters. And so this seems like a good way of getting fewer parameters. Okay, so, yeah. Did you guys compare this using something, you know, like Bayesian information criteria or alkali to sort of look at how well you do with the fewer number of parameters that you guys... So you used one of the model selection no, techniques we, we that lets you trade those two. No, we did kind of a Pareto analysis. So, so we, we kind of looked at the Pareto curve trading off a uh, number of parameters and likelihood. Okay. Because and there's there's like model selection sort of statistical things that you can do to sort yeah, of say I'd, like this. I'd like to talk you, more about how you think that would work. Uh, we, we've I haven't about, thought it through. I just kind of wonder. Well, we've thought about Bayesian information criterion for other things, but not for this. So, uh, I mean, I guess that, that would force you to commit to some kind of measure of how complex it is to add another parameter. Right, right. right. Well, th within that sort of estimation, there's a, this idea of like how much penalty you incur for models that include parameters that don't explain much, right. that don't have much explanatory power and stuff. So. Right. Okay. No, I'm not an expert that's on this That's a good point. It's not a connection we've made. Okay. A anyhow, so I guess I want to claim that uh, that this uh, spike plus on QCH strikes us as being the the best way of trading off accuracy against number of parameters. I haven't shown you the data because I'm trying to keep my slides down here, but but it's pretty convincing. I mean, it's almost as good as as a, a model that has many, many uh, sort of histogram levels. Um, okay, so the last thing I want to tell you about is what we call level zero meta models. And remember at the beginning I told you that level zero people are assumed in the literature to uniformly randomize. That, that seemed like a safe thing to say when we didn't really think they existed anyway. 
And what we really wanted was just to make sure that we covered the whole space, that there wasn't something they weren't doing. Um, but we should maybe reconsider this when it occurs, when we're finding that the best performing models have large numbers of level zero agents. We should maybe take a little bit more seriously modeling level zero agents rather than just having them be uniform. Yeah. So in, in these models, though, generally, you couldn't distinguish the idea between, uh, they're not necessarily level zero agents, but they're level, they think they're level one agents that are just reasoning poorly. And so if you have enough in this, if you have a population of people who are reasoning incorrectly, that they sort of balance each other out. That, that's be able sort to of true, but I think you're that, being right? too charitable. I think what you really want to say there is you just you have the wrong model, Leighton Brown. Like, it's just, <laughs> you know, it's just totally the wrong thing. No, right? no, no, no. I'm not saying that. I'm just because if they're reasoning incorrectly, but they're, like, what does it mean? To, like level one is a sort of stipulative definition. If they're reasoning incorrectly, but they're level one, then they're just kind of not level one. There's some other thing that my model doesn't have a way of talking about. Right, but it's it's a way that I think it's the right generalization. But I think that sort of saying like these people like there's individuals that are just sort of playing the characterization of individuals who are playing completely randomly is maybe not correct because in their minds they're not sitting there going like doo, 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 that when they're playing. I think you're way. you're now agreeing with me. I think I probably am. <laughs> Let's go a little further here right. and see whether we find ourselves to be in agreement. Uh, but. Uh, but, you know, so I, I guess I want to say there's sort of two ways you could go from here. You could say, I reject this whole framework. I think people are doing some completely different thing from what you've proposed. I mean, notice, unfortunately, we don't have a way of saying, you know, what fraction of, of perfection did we achieve by this model, right? We're just getting these likelihood scores. We don't know that we've done the best we possibly could do. Um, so maybe there's just something else out there that's just much better. Um, or on the other hand, maybe we want to stay within this model framework. We think it's doing pretty well. And we want to say, um, how can we change the models to make them work better? And then that's what I'm trying to do here. And in particular, you know, we've made a strong assumption about level zero people. We've, we've stipulated what they do. And I'm going to imagine something richer there. So I notice level zero agents are important for two reasons. They're important because I think 30% of the world is level zero. But they're also important because I think that the, the other 70% of the world directly or indirectly reacts to beliefs about what the level zero people are going to do. So if you change the level zero model, you actually change everyone's behavior because the more sophisticated people are responding to level zero. So here's, uh, oh, <laughs> I said submitted. It's being accepted and published. That was at EC last year. <laughs> um, so, so here's the idea. A, a level zero meta model is what we call a mapping from an arbitrary game to a level zero distribution over that game's actions. Um, and basically, this meta model is going to be something that has its own parameters. Uh, so it's going to spit out a level zero model, which we can then drop into QLK or QCH. Uh, and then given this level zero model that it spits out, um, we're going to be able to uh, combine that with QLK and, and overall make predictions. So something you start worrying about when you try to do this is where is the line in the sand going to be between level zero and level one? If I'm going to make level zero richer, if I'm going to start allowing level zero agents to do smarter things than randomizing, then at what, at what point do they start being level one agents? And I think in some sense that's the question you were asking. So what we decided was uh, what distinguishes level zero from level one is that level one agents reason about what the other agents will do in terms of having explicit beliefs about what other agents will do. So level zero agents are thinking, um, they're, they're not forming beliefs about their opponents. They might be thinking about the game, they might be identifying some game theoretic properties of the game, but they're not thinking about what other people are going to do. And as soon as you start modeling your opponent, you start climbing the level hierarchy. So uh, let me tell you, we did, there's a reason this paper took two years to write. We did everything you can imagine. We tried so many sophisticated ideas that were beautiful and clever and didn't work. And uh, just everything that I liked, I mean, James just got so fed up with me because every idea that I thought was spectacular just didn't work. It's really humbling to work with data because so many of these things just you know, they, they were all right, but they were just never really much better than, than QCH. So what I'm going to describe is a bit disappointing to me in the sense that it's more opaque than I would like, but it's spectacular. And, and we don't entirely understand why it's so spectacular, but it's really good. Uh, so here's how it, what, what it's built on top of. So we have five binary features. And, and one thing that we wrestled with is should these features be binary? Wouldn't it be nice for them to be continuous? All the continuous ones were terrible. So uh, all of these choices happen for a reason. Uh, so five binary features. The first feature is min-min unfairness. So for every action that a, a level zero agent considers, we ask, 
does this action contribute to the least unfair outcome? So I look at all the outcomes, I look at the utility differences between all the outcomes, I find the one outcome in the game matrix that is the least unfair, or if they're ties, I find all the ones that have exactly the same minimizing amount of unfairness. And that feature is, is true if that action contributes to that outcome, even if it can also contribute to various other outcomes, and it's false if otherwise, even if it gets almost there. Um, strange that we would want that to be binary, but we do. Um, max max payoff, we ask, does this action contribute to my highest payoff outcome? So I again look at all the outcomes in the game, I find the one that has the biggest number for me, restricting everybody to pure strategies. Um, minimax regret, I ask, does this action have the lowest maximum regret? So uh, the, the regret of an action is how much utility I could gain by switching to something else. Um, given um, the, the worst thing that my opponent might do. And uh, efficiency, does this action contribute to the social welfare maximizing outcome? So uh, everything uh, except um, regret is thinking about, well, I guess it's in a sense three, but it's certainly one, two, and five are thinking about outcomes rather than actions, which might seem a bit strange, but, but there it is. I mean, it's, it's well defined, right? But, but we're, we're having to think about actions here, and we're nevertheless sort of being focused completely on outcomes, even if that outcome is dominated, you know, even if there's some game theoretically strong reason why we shouldn't play that outcome, we're ignoring that, and we're, we're just being drawn by a single outcome. So I, I need to define, uh, lastly, before I give you my results, what I mean by an informative feature. And an informative feature is a feature that can distinguish at least one pair of actions. So if a feature doesn't fire at all, uh, or if it fires everywhere, I guess maybe none of them uh, are unable to fire that I showed you, uh, but if it fires on everything, if there's, a, for example, a tie, that everything is equally fair, uh, then the feature is uninformative because, um, because every action is, uh, is just as fair, so I'm, I'm going to be getting uh, a one on everything. So, uh, so I'm going to call that feature uninformative. And then what I'll predict for an action, here's, what, here's my, my level zero meta model. What I'm going to predict for an action is proportional to some weight plus a sum over the features of an indicator that asks, is that feature informative, multiplied by an indicator that says, was that feature true, multiplied by a weight. So I'm going to have a weight for each feature, uh, and I'm going to basically add that weight in if the feature was informative and if it fired uh, for that given action. And then I'm going to take this whole thing and normalize it so that it becomes a probability distribution. So this is my weighted linear model. And this is the thing I'm saying is kind of opaque. Um, you know, I, I might have liked that this was something more than linear, but believe me, we tried and we really we, we did well with the linear guy. So, so here's the model. Any questions about the model? Okay, uh, let me let me just walk you through how you would evaluate. Oh, sorry, yeah, go ahead. Oh well, I have a couple of questions. Uh, well, I have a couple of uh, a question on the previous slide. Uh, well, the question is, well, it seems to me that those features that depend on the particular type of game you are going to play, is that true? Yeah, I think actually that's what you'll see in the example that I'm about to go through. So uh, whether a feature is informative or not is, uh, is something that you're going to learn about the game. Uh, you know, that's going to differ from one game to another. But you know, what we really want is something that says, um, you know, in this particular game, here's what you're going to do. Uh, if you're a level zero person. So actually, let me, let me step back and give you some motivation that really motivated me that I haven't told you yet. When we played Traveler's Dilemma all together, a lot of you played um, 100. So far, the models that I've shown you have not been able to explain this fact. Because 100 is uh, a dominated action, which means no level greater than zero could ever play it with, with reasonable probability, because it's not a best response to anything. Um, and so, it's really an action that's going to get mostly played by level zero agents. And my level zero agents are uniformly randomizing over 98 actions. And so very little weight is coming on 100 from level zero either. So we weren't able to do very well there. And th that seems like a good example of level zero play. I think it's very hard to argue that playing 100 in Traveler's Dilemma is a level one action. Because you're really, if you're thinking about what the other person will do, you're going to start to move down um, in what number you give because it's a dominated action. You're going to start to notice that it's dominated. So I think you're a level zero agent if you're playing 100. You're, you're, doing, you're thinking something non-strategic if you're playing 100. But you may be thinking something richer, even if it's non-strategic. 
And so I think these features are attempts to get at the kinds of things that you're thinking. I think you might be thinking, this is fair. That's, that's one thing people say. This is the biggest payoff I can get in the game. It's only yeah. voted 100. I would like to object a little bit. Someone always <laughs> does. <It's okay. laughs> By saying that part of my reasoning was if the other guy also votes 100, then I get 100 and he gets 100 as well. And yeah, no, but that's, that's, that's my point. That's non-dominating. I, I know it's dominated. No, but, but that's exactly the kind of reason that I'm allowing the, level zero agents sure. to make in this case. Okay. Right? Because my point is you didn't form explicit beliefs about the other guy. But I did. I said that if he, bids, if he goes for 100, then I'll get 100. So you interrupted me in the middle of the sentence. Oh. You, didn't, you didn't form explicit beliefs about the other guy and then best respond to them. No, I mean, that's right. Right? Which yeah. is what we claim the level one agents did. Okay. Right? Because if you said, I think the other guy's going to do 100, and therefore, it makes sense for me to do 100. Yeah. And that, that gave theoretically, that's just not true. Yeah, that's right. So, so instead, what you said is things like feature one and feature five and feature two, right? You said, you know, th this would be fair for both of us. We would both get the same thing, which mm -hmm. seems good. And I mean, notice that the way you just reasoned was about an outcome rather than an action, right? You said, I like the outcome 100, 100. You didn't say, I like the action 100, which is what game theory kind of expects you to be doing, right? You said you yeah. focused on one outcome. Mm. And you said it seems sensible for us to get to this outcome, mm. and uh, and you said you know this this would get us a lot. This you know implicitly I think you were appealing to the idea that you know this gives me almost my highest payoff. Mm. This gives you know th this is social welfare maximizing mm. in fact, and it's fair. So there's kind of a lot to recommend it in terms of these qualitative things that matter to people. Mm. And I mean we didn't pull all these features out of the hat. These are mm. things that cognitive psychologists have identified as being important. To so, so I, I think you know that that's a good uh, demonstration of level one thinking in action, actually. And I, I think maybe we shouldn't denigrate level one so much, right? I mean, it's worth noticing that if you play a hundred and you end up with somebody else who played a hundred in Traveler's Dilemma, you're not best responding, but you just got a hundred. Mm. But if you play Nash Equilibrium, then you know, aren't you smart? But you got two. Mm. So <laughs> there's uh, there's something to be said for uh, for the way people think some of the time. I think. Uh, anyway, I'm sorry. Did that uh, sufficiently answer your question? Uh, over whichever part of Australia okay, you are in the top left? Uh, well, it, well, kind of, because again, I think it's, you said, I think that's because uh, I would say, if you collect the features, you have to know what the game is. Uh, and then, well, in uh, the travel dilemma, yeah, again, if you play one of the stuff physics, it would be that one, but you can pick other games where, again, a level zero might choose uh, one of the other, and that's why if you put together many, many different games, uh, that's why you might not get good results in uh, just taking those models. Okay, so let me pick up on two things you said. So, so the first uh, is, let me remind you that what I want to do is pick parameters that will allow me to evaluate my model on any game. Right? So once I fix these weights, my parameter here are, are these weights, one for each feature. Once I fix these things, I can evaluate this on any game you give me. It's going to do different things on different games, but it's well defined for every game. The, the second thing you said is it might not do very well. Uh, and I agree completely. In fact, I've been telling you this sob story that often it hasn't done very well for me, so I, I feel that pain acutely. But, but the point is, it's well defined, I can evaluate it, and we'll see how well it does. And in a, in a slide after next, I'm going to show you how well it does. But, but that's something that we can just evaluate. Uh, before I do that, I just want to walk you through this to make sure you're all with me. So let me just show you this completely arbitrary game here, and show you how I would evaluate the model on this game. So uh, first of all, the min-max regret here is not informative because it turns out that min-max regret uh, is 60 for every action uh, in this game. So I, I think I'm looking at, I'm considering player one here. So for each of player one's three actions, uh, he has a min-max regret of 60. And so, uh, so for example, if player one plays X, then player two can play C, which causes player one to have a regret of 60, which is the most regret he can have. And, and you can work the same thing through for the other actions. So, so it's not informative, so uh, we're not going to consider it. Um, 50, 49 is the fairest outcome. It's the outcome that minimizes the utility difference between the players. And so we're going to call Y the min-min unfair outcome. Y and Z maximize minimum payoff. Um, and so they, uh, they both fire for the, the max-min feature. Y leads to the highest sum of utilities. And so that's the max max outcome. And X has the best, the highest best case utility of 100, so it's the unique feature that fires for that. And so then when I compute these weights, here's how I compute them. So everybody gets weight zero, 
uh, then action x gets weight, the, the weight for max max, action y gets the weights for min min, total, and fairness, and z gets the weight for min min because it tied with y of min min. And so then I take all of these, these weights, and I, I sum them up and I normalize, and that's going to be my probability distribution over the actions. So given these weights, this is something I can evaluate on an arbitrary game like this one. Yeah. And should the first outcome for ZA be 40 as well, to get the non-informative min max regret? Uh, you've got to be much smarter than me if you think I can do this on my feet. I, I've looked at this carefully in the past so and believe that it's correct, but... If but player one be. plays Z, yeah. and player two plays uh, A, uh, well, no. I can't... I I'm not even sure what you're claiming. I don't see why the regret would be 60 players one plays Z. Uh, let's look at it afterwards. I'm not smart okay. enough to do things like yeah. this on my feet. Uh, <laughs> I, I believe this to be true, but if it isn't true, you can imagine how we would change it yes. in a way that would make it true. Um, but but I, I, I do think I've grown through it. I think true, but we'll see. Uh, anyway, be that as it may, here's how it does. So um, so here I'm showing you only on our, uh, I think, Combo 8 data set, our, our biggest data set of all. Um, and here's... Um, QCH, which is our most preferred model. And then for fun, we also compared level K and cognitive hierarchy. And of course, in each case, we're fitting the parameters uh, to do the best we can, uh, uh, you know, given the new level zero model. And uh, we did this both with um, a uniform level zero model and with our crazy weighted linear model that I just showed you. And here's what we see. So basically, the blue bars are what I showed you um, at the beginning of the talk. Uh, where all we had was the uniform model, and, and so what we were seeing before, we see again, is that QCH is much better there. Um, you know, remember, this is a log scale, so these differences are pretty enormous. This means this is like a factor of uh, 10 to the 10 more likely. Um, but so the first thing we see is when we move to this new level zero meta model, things get a lot better. This is a, a pretty significant difference. We, we tried for a long, long time before we found something that moved the bar that much. Uh, the other thing that I think is almost uh, equally interesting is that the differences between the three models almost go away when we move to this new level zero model. So it seems like, you know, in a sense, the, the quantal response and the difference between the ways we handle the levels are kind of compensating for something that might be better modeled as uh, the way level zero agents behave. And if we get that right, it doesn't matter so much how we handle the other levels. Um, which I think I, I'd say here now on the slide. Um, the, um, the other thing I might show you, uh, we also, incidentally, I, I think I don't have a slide. Oh, I do have a slide for this. Well, I'll, I'll do it this way first then. So looking at the level zero agents, what do we see about the importance of their respective parameters? Maybe we can do that same Bayesian analysis on the parameters. And what we see is that fairness is overwhelmingly the most important parameter. People seem to be really concerned with getting to the fair outcomes, as indeed um, maybe some of you were in Traveler's Dilemma. Um, the others are much smaller, but, but they're all uh, well identified. So they, they're all uh, quite steep in the CDF. So the model is quite pretty sure about the ordering between them. And it's very sure that all of them uh, are greater than zero. So it, it thinks that all of them are important to have in the model, but, um, but fairness is by far the most important. We looked at subset models, and, and they weren't as good. It, it really helped us to have all five of these features. Um, we had other features that we were eventually able to throw away and leave us with these five. Um, Looking at the level distributions, we see um, messier distributions than we had uh, before. We had much smoother um, CDFs with the, um, the, the uniform models. Um, but nevertheless, we see uh, kind of a, a cleaner story. So we now see way, way more level zero agents. We now have 45% uh, or more level zero agents. Uh, and in fact, the model um, has probability that goes out pretty high. We've just truncated it here so that you can see it a little bit more clearly. Um, it has very few level one agents and more level two agents, but still not a whole lot, and, and relatively larger spreads than before. So um, we have uh, lower variance estimates and um, really high predictions about how, how many level zero agents there are, which I think makes sense because once, once we have this richer notion of level zero, it might be that that actually is uh, capturing a lot of what people think about. Um, and I guess that's, uh, that's where I'm going to leave it. So 
uh, I guess I've told you about three things. I've claimed that behavioral game theory gives us a way of trying to predict how people actually play games. And uh, I, I would particularly argue for this spike Poisson variant of quantile cognitive hierarchy, if, if you want to use such a model. It's possible to analyze these models to understand parameter importance and to see whether uh, parameters are well identified. And uh, it turns out that a, a more realistic meta model for level zero agents uh, dramatically improves the performance of all of the three iterative models and almost erases the differences between the models themselves. So uh, I, I hope that we're kind of now at a point where these models are a good starting point for people to um, start doing applications, looking at more interesting data, and uh, you know, trying to uh, see if we can apply some of this stuff. So thanks for your attention. Great. Thanks. Thanks. I have a question if uh, Monash. Hi, Monash. Uh, hi, I'm Carlton. I was curious, you mentioned that you know, you've been looking to work with Google on AdWords stuff. And I'm just curious, uh, do you think in ad auctions like that, there are uh, participants who are thinking, well, if my opponent plays this, then I'll play that, da, 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 kind of logic? Because it's quite a complicated system. Uh, yeah, so I think you know eBay has some large number of full-time employees who do nothing but manage their AdWords campaign. And I think they are thinking pretty carefully about it because they're spending giant amounts of money on it. And they're not, not only are they thinking carefully about it, but they're, they're frequently updating as they learn things. And so I, I think it's reasonable to think that they're playing something like an equilibrium strategy because if they're far away from best responding, I think they'll notice that and change. And I think a, a vivid demonstration of that is in the, one of the earliest uh, sponsored search papers, they showed some behavioral, uh, some actual data from uh, Yahoo auctions back when they were generalized first price, where you saw people were really oscillating, where they, um, th there's no pure strategy equilibrium in the generalized first price auction, and so people were playing pure strategies, and they would you know, raise and raise and raise their bids until they changed positions, and then they would drop, and then they would raise and raise and raise again until they drop, and you see these sort of sawtooth patterns that, that really were consistent with the idea that people were just constantly best, uh, best responding to each other and getting caught in a cycle. So, so I think there are definitely big players who equilibrium is the right way to think about them. But then I think there are mom and pop places that are, you know, I'm running a bed and breakfast or something. I want to put an AdWords auction up. I'm not going on there every five minutes to best respond to something. I'm probably just kind of thinking a little bit about what I'd be willing to pay and putting a bid in the system and walking away. And I think that's kind of the long tail of AdWords. Those people don't represent um, the, the biggest bidders, but they represent most of the bidders. And I think for those kinds of people, behavioral game theory is probably the right place to start thinking about how they're going to behave. I, I don't think these are kind of criminal masterminds. <laughs> Which supports the level zero work, right? Yeah, I think that's one thing that pushed us in that direction, absolutely. Yep. I have another one, if no. Uh, th that's certainly something that has been considered in the, uh, the behavioral game theory literature. I, mean, I think most notably people have looked at the ultimatum game, the way that uh, sort of the importance of fairness varies across cultures. Um, and really what we've done is uh, we've sort of introduced a general methodology and a parameterized framework that you can fit to a given data set. So I think based on that work, we would expect that very different cultures would you know, end up with different weights of these parameters. I think that's one reason of realizing why a parameterized model like this is probably necessary. You know, it's, if you're a game theorist, you look at this and you think, man, fine, Nash equilibrium doesn't do well, but it's so simple. You know, it's so nice that you don't have all these parameters to deal with. It seems a shame to give that up. And you know, I think you're giving me ammunition for why we sort of have no choice. Right? When we have good evidence that different cultures fundamentally behave differently, we can't hope to have a model that just knows that. And so I think that, you know, that that's what some of these parameters really aim to describe. But beyond that, I don't have a deep insight into you know what particular cultures would do it. We need more data for that. One thing this may leave out is the complexity of doing this reasoning. So these are players who really have to play within a certain time bound, as you indicated at the beginning of the talk. Then it's going to be more difficult for them to do the reasoning, and then they may be afraid they'll make a mistake and lose their money, etc. So that, that's you know, actually our next paper. That's, that's okay. something we're actively thinking about. So. Um, so, so here's something that, as a preview for what we're currently working on, and uh, come on, James, if you're working hard right now, we might submit to AAA at age kind of this year, we'll see. Um, what we've, uh, 
here's something that troubles me. Again, uh, I'll say this in terms of the traveler's dilemma because we've all thought about it. Uh, I, I told you that in the traveler's dilemma with a penalty of two, people tend to play 100. Mm -hmm. And the traveler's dilemma with a penalty of 50, people tend not to play 100. Mm -hmm. Well, if we look at our, our current level zero state-of-the-art model, it doesn't do something different in those two cases. And if you think about what really happens there, what, I think what happens is you come up with the level zero prediction. You say 100, 100, that looks like a nice outcome. And then I think what you do is you evaluate it and you ask yourself, does something terrible happen when the other guy best responds to this? And what you find in the, uh, in the penalty of two case that you guys all played is nothing terrible happens. Maybe I lose two. I'm prepared to lose two. I would still have pretty close to the 100 that I was kind of anchored on. And so I'm happy with that. I'm just going to, I'm going to leave it with my level zero play. When the penalty is 50, you say, oh my god, I lose half my payoff right away. And I can start to see an inductive chain unfolding here. This looks pretty bad for me. I think I, I better think more. And, and I, maybe I better start to think strategically. Maybe I better start to be a level one or a level two guy rather than being a level zero guy. So I'm actually convinced by that kind of argument that that our level is probably not an indelible fact about us, but it's probably the result of a process by which we think about the game. Where you start out with a level zero strategy, and then you try to decide if that's good enough. And I, I think the way you decide whether it's good enough has this flavor of wanting to limit the amount of computation that you do, which is why I, I say this in response to your question. Or to estimate how likely the other guy is to take that action. Well, in other words, I mean, is it worth the computation, yeah. right? Yeah. If, if the computation costs me something, I only want to do it if it looks like it's going to pay for itself. Mm -hmm. and, uh, we're, we're trying to get those models working. We kind of believe in them. Right now, we're in the phase we were in before where lots of things are doing about as well as everything we had before. Here's hoping. Yeah. Um, so these models are only useful if the agents aren't aware of what they're thinking. Like, uh, because like anyone, if people have thought about rationality before, they'll be applying some model of what the rational thing is to do. So, and even with travelers, they'll end that there's an extended or alternative notions of rationality, like super rationality, which would actually solve it, like give the 100 solution. Um, so, I mean, shouldn't game theory be more prescriptive than descriptive? Like, I mean, more it seems like a very philosophical question. I mean, I, I think I, I set out to answer the, the descriptive problem. I think. You know, in a sense, I think the best prescriptive model of game theory is describe what the other guys are going to do and best respond to that. I, I think. But you know, that's impossible in the sense that it will be dependent on the context. Like, shouldn't we be trying to uh, capture rationality, not what some people will do? Well, I think that that has typically been the, the game theoretic project, and you know, certainly there's a whole lot of work that's tried to do that. And you know, in some of my work, I've tried to do that. That's what. Uh, Toby criticized me for it at Prekai because everything was about uh, standard rationality. So, so it certainly has a warm place in my heart. But, but I think it's a question worth asking. You know, how can I describe what people actually do just for the purposes of describing it, not with trying to take that onto a slippery slope of becoming a new prescriptive notion. And I think what makes that so compelling to me is that people are really pretty predictable, that it's actually pretty possible to predict what people do, that, that people do some pretty regular things that are often nevertheless kind of different from what the game theoretic model oh. propose. And that tells me this is just a problem worth thinking about. Um, is anyone on the screen? Yeah. A question in Canberra. So you talked about efficiency. If behind your game theory, what's the, what's the current state of literature in terms of when there's a bunch of agents or players, how efficient are the outcomes in how close to pre or efficient or socially efficient are the actual outcomes of the game, whether it's, whether it's a one-shot game or a, or a repeated game? It's a good question. That's not something we've looked at. I, I would imagine there are probably some games where we can get pretty far away from efficiency, um, but I'm, uh, I'm not sure. We haven't, we haven't dug in. But it, I, I would be, I'd be pretty surprised if you could establish that this was always close to efficient. I think that's it's very unlikely. Yeah, well, yeah, I was just wondering how far from efficient or whether that's modified. Yeah, really I, I would guess it's, you know, you can probably find a degenerate case where it's arbitrarily far. If, okay. if, I, if I had to bet, but I don't know. Yeah. Uh, is there another hand there? Yeah. Yeah, and more of a technical uh, question on the optimization part. At some point, you mentioned that you were trying to solve the continuous non complex uh, for their problem. Uh, can you just say more on the technology you're using? Yeah, so we, we used Nelder Mead for a while, then we, uh, we switched to an algorithm called CMAES, um, which stands for 
CMA evolutionary strategy. What does CMA stand for? I forget. It's a um, it's, it's basically a, a kind of a, a swarm sort of particle optimization method that sort of draws an ellipse and finds a gradient um, that it does pretty well for continuous um, moderate dimensional problems. Um, so that's uh, that's mostly what we do for the maximum likelihood estimation. Um, for the uh, the density estimation thing, it's a, a sequential Monte Carlo. It's actually two different levels of Monte Carlo sampling nested inside each other. Um, there, you, know, you, you run a Markov chain until uh, it converges. The, the big trick is trying to detect how long you need to run the Markov chain before you generate a sample. And there's, there's a bunch of kind of voodoo that I, I can't uh, remember off the top of my head, but it's in the paper. Yeah. A uh, fundamental question about what the utilities actually represent in, uh, in all the games that you use data points for. Were there all this money that was paid to the participants? Yes. So that was always a positive gain uh, of some kind. It's always positive. Uh, right. Sometimes it was a lottery, so sometimes it's expected payments where they would do something like one of your games, you know, one of ten games is going to pay out mm -hmm. and we're not going to tell you which one. Right. So yeah, I guess you're uh, familiar with uh, Kahneman's work and uh, Nobel Prize winner and prospect theory and uh, the way that people uh, treat expected gains very differently from expected losses. So even, uh, yeah, I'm just thinking, what happens if, uh, let's take the Traveler's Dilemma game and just subtract 100 from all the utilities, so it's a completely equivalent game, but the way you think about it now is how to minimize the loss or avoid the loss rather than to gain the, the highest amount. So it's been shown that people think about losses very differently than they think about gains. Absolutely, uh, yeah. So, so I, I think that the, you know, the authors of these studies are, are well aware of prospect theory, and I, I think have taken care to keep all of the payoffs positive partly for that reason. So I think there's, there's nothing that a subject could easily code as a loss. I, I think you're right that, uh, and I think there's, there's even, um, yeah, that's all I want to say about that. But, I think you're right that, that if, if, there, if you were to set it up so that you could be both winning and losing, people would likely play differently. And uh, I think your know, prospect theory gives us you know, a decent model for thinking about how that would work. Mm -hmm. That would be a good starting point. I don't know that anyone has investigated uh, in that direction. I mean, really, people have done very little in this direction. So I think there, there are lots of you know, good kind of next step sorts of questions that, that one can imagine. I, I've actually never heard that one before. But I think that's a particularly promising thing to try. Um, somebody else? Anyone we haven't heard from yet? Let's go back to the classics then, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, you said at some point that you could only measure relative performance of different models you had. You could only measure which one? Of the, uh, the relative performance. Yeah. And do you have any idea how later we could get to a point where we have an absolute idea of how close to the best model that could ever exist? Or is it just a I, I've had some ideas. I, I, I'm worried about, you, you're always trying to get me to think on my feet. I'm worried I'm going to say something that, that is kind of stupid. Um, I, I think what you can do, I, I'm trying to remember why we haven't done this, if it's just that it would have wasted James's time and we just never did it, or if there's some statistical argument against it. But it seems to me one thing you can do is say, on every game, I can observe the empirical distribution of play on that game. And I'm never going to do better than the empirical distribution of play on that game. And so that's, you know, for this data set, the thing that's going to be, that's going to maximize likelihood is the actual empirical distribution of play on the games that I've got. Or is that actually true? Does the for, empirical for distribution? Every game. Yeah. For a given game, I think it does. Or does the mode of that distribution maximize likelihood? I'm trying to remember. Anyway, I mean, there, there, there might be ways like that that you could get upper bounds. And you could say, you're within some fraction of an upper bound. I think one reason we might not have done that is we've been afraid that reviewers would misunderstand these things and think that you know if we went from like eight percent to ten percent of the upper bound, that meant that all the models were terrible. Whereas it probably means that the upper bounds are really not very informative. So uh, it might be we, there's that kind of reason why we haven't gone down the road. But you know I think the, the question of how well can you do with an actual model, I, I'm pretty sure there's no answer to. It, right? How well can you do? On, by some unrealistic bound on, on how well it would be possible to do it, I think it's possible to come up with, but it, that, that's only going to tell you much if the bound is tight, which I fear it would be. Do you have a question? Uh, I was wondering about this same thing. Ultimately, you would want to be able to say how good is your model at predicting or how accurate the model would be at predicting the human behavior on a completely new game. 
So you feed in the new game to that model, it predicts something, and you would like to know how accurate that is. And accuracy would mean 100% if you can predict perfectly well what humans would do. And you see, that, that's but the that's problem. impossible. It's really I know. tempting to, to have you know 100% mean predicting perfectly well, but when when you're looking at samples from a distribution, that's just not really true, right? If you're trying to predict how how biased the coin is, you know, there's no there's no notion of 100% correctness, which is really too bad because it, it would be so much more satisfying if, if there was. But I, I think you're forced you know into this messier kind of likelihood ratio sort of world. I'm not saying likelihood is absolutely the only thing you can do, but I think that it's going to have this similar kind of flavor. I have to come back to what I uh, asked earlier about the artificial setting. Do you think in particular the last observation that you made that fairness plays such an important role is because it was students playing with students, uh, psychology students playing with psychology students, and all that was at stake was a small gain of $10 or $100, and that it would be completely different if you look at real-world games where you are in a life-threatening situation, for example, and you have to make decisions. Or you have to make decisions about uh, much more than just $10. And then fairness would never play the same role that you observed in those games. That's a good question. I mean, you're asking me a question about what I believe, and we're going beyond what I have data to support. But mm -hmm. uh, I believe that fairness is really important. I think we're going to see it remain important. And one example that has struck me as a, a sort of demonstration of how much people care about fairness is the fact that people honk at other cars when they cut them off in traffic. Um, because you know, you're essentially playing a, you're, you're fighting over a scarce resource. You have a sort of social protocol which says who's supposed to go first. And if somebody gets ahead of you when they're not supposed to, you know, honking at them is a kind of punishment. You sort of, you, know, you, you make them feel a little bit sad. You take a little bit of utility away from them. <laughs> and, uh, and it's interesting that you bother to do it, given that you know, you're not thinking to yourself, you know, with some probability, this same guy is going to try to cut me off again at some point in the future, and so I might change his future behavior by hogging at him. You just think, behavior like this needs to be punished. You're going against the social contract. This is wrong. And at least that's what I'm thinking. I don't know what you're thinking. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, I, I think it's interesting that people think that way because it, it really doesn't serve their interests at all. I think we're conditioned as part of being in a society to just have a to enforce norms of fairness even when we don't directly benefit from enforcing those norms. And I think that's just pretty deeply ingrained in us. So, so I think for that reason it will crop up elsewhere. Now, you know, there might be some kinds of life and death situations where um, you know, it, the stakes are sufficiently high that I, I stop caring as much about fairness. That, that's probably also true. But I think in a, a pretty wide range of situations people really do get into I think that this will happen. Another observation made in data. Looks like you, some players will probably be better than other players, but in your data set they're all mixed in. So have you thought about trying to work Oops. out which players are doing the best and then modeling those, see if the model picks up their yeah, behavior? Yeah, yeah so, so another way you could go indeed is to try to model individual people rather than trying to, to model aggregates. Uh, the main reason we didn't do that is that most of the data available to us doesn't identify individual people. Yeah, so we just had undifferentiated observations of play, and we wanted to work with as much data as we could. Uh, but I think that's an obvious direction to go. Mm -hmm. it, it, clearly, it makes certain things harder because your data will be sparser in some mm -hmm. senses, but, but the, there might also be kind of rich patterns in what people do across time that would you know, allow you to aggregate usefully. So yeah, no, but it addresses this guy's point that you know, even though these people are not rational according to Nash, they're still actually doing very well in the game, so they must be doing something right. Right. Yeah, I think that's right. Yeah. Oh, this is a random anecdote, but I've been talking with, you, none of you guys are from the Experimental Econ group over at UNSW. I tried to get them to come, but we, they had a workshop and all this other stuff, and we, uh, we might run some, s some stuff over there because they have a, a built purpose lab. Uh, but uh, one of the things they said is they recruit broadly from the whole population of students in a given year. Um, and in the sort of latter half of the second semester, you'll end up getting very different results for your games that you run. You might run standard by matrix games or something. And in the latter, as the semester goes on, you see the less sophisticated players leave the pool um, because they're not they're not good at winning the money, right? And so the better, more sophisticated players actually stay in the pool through the semester. And at the end, are very like you're left with this pool of people who are very good at identifying how to extract money from these games. And they basically do this as a part-time job. You should job. read Nate Silver's book because he talks about that on, in terms of online poker. Yeah. So it's easy to beat the 
the few poor players, but not so easy to beat the very good players. Yeah. So it's, it's interesting talking, hearing, because they had a workshop a week or two ago about like different sort of effects that occur.